That was... Oh, you're done too. Yeah, but... Let's go. But first, a few things out of the way. Difficulty doesn't matter. Alternative AI drags out the game. Alternative balancing brings back the experience system of Gothic 2 Night of the Raven, rebalances the game, and adds in a few new things. Just like in Gothic 2, the beginning of Gothic 3 spoils the ending of Gothic 2, including that big twist at the end. Your hero and his friends arrive on the mainland, where the last big battle of the war against the orcs is summarized in a video sequence. King Robar is about to lose the war when the orcs attack, but then the fire mages create a magic barrier to protect the castle. Some people might wonder why this barrier is different, but this isn't really a special barrier like the one in the Valley of Mines, nor is it being manipulated by a demon. This puts the war to a stalemate and our hero arrives in Mertana. But why doesn't he bring any of his equipment with him? I mean, we had a lot of important stuff with us. About that... Don't. Pirates! Hello? We kill the orcs, and we're told that Zardas destroyed the rune magic, and that he's the leader of the orcs. How does this random guy know this? Maybe the orcs have Wi-Fi. After a lot more plot holes and bed riding, our main quest is to find Xarda somewhere on this kinda huge map. This story doesn't make sense. Yes! Is there really nothing else to the beginning? Just find Zardas? Gothic 3, very much like Gothic 1, only gives you a vague idea of what you have to do to make the story move along. Even if you find Xardas, you are being fed off with another fetch quest. Those two quests are the requirements to unlock the end game and they will fill out about 30 to 40 hours of your journey. Unlike the previous games, Gothic 3 has no complex quests at all. The most you'll ever get are quests that unlock more arbitrary quests and you usually only have option A or option B to complete a quest. It's more similar to an MMO rather than actually being Gothic. Many of the quests are also bugged. If you do some too early or if you trigger an event wrong, then you could ruin your entire game without you even knowing about it. The second main quest can also easily go wrong on your first playthrough without you ever noticing. Though the game leaves it completely up to you when you want to end the game, as long as you know where everything is and what you have to do, it's perfectly possible to finish this game within five hours as many of the seemingly important quests ultimately have little relevance. Which leads us to the endings of this game. No ending in this game is worth going the extra mile for them. You have three endings and some details might change depending on how you did some overarching and some smaller quests. You have the choice between Inos, the ending that requires the most Inos. effort and takes about three to five hours to do. The cliffhanger ending takes about 30 to 50 minutes and about a third of it is taking a boring long stroll. And finally, you can join Beliar, which takes about one or two hours to do. No ending has anything resembling a final boss. Every ending is disappointing, every ending has plot holes, and there isn't even anything to really look at. It's just a bunch of pictures while the hero does the narration. This is just sad, considering all the excitement that Gothic 2 had built up into the story. Lore is rewritten or dropped without any explanation. Most of Gothic 3 is a plot hole. The writing is usually mediocre at best with better and worse moments. And the story as a whole just simply sucks. It doesn't even have a real finale. It just ends with a low resolution video for all endings. This also translates to the gameplay. Instead of using what made Gothic 1 and 2 enjoyable, the developer has decided to rework the entire formula, and if this game wouldn't be set in the Gothic universe, one might not even recognize this as a Gothic title. Instead of starting out weak, you already have some stats, though with only basic skills. To start out with the good stuff, the game welcomes you with a masterpiece of a main theme, and it keeps this amazing score up throughout the game. This definitely is a contender for the best video game soundtrack, but sadly, it suffers from being extremely repetitive due to the sheer size of the world and the lack of several battle themes. Keep that in mind, please, as we move on. The open world became the central focus, sacrificing good progression in both plot and gameplay in the process. The scale of the world is really impressive, and for the first 20 hours, it's also a lot of fun to explore as the atmosphere of Gothic 3 can grab you occasionally by immersing you in dense forests or vast deserts, which is also thanks to the lively vegetation and the soundtrack. 
This change in scope comes with extensive costs however. You can easily find places where the world just simply feels unfinished and the amount of items, quests etc are more and more reduced the closer you are to the end game, including the various reskins of the few enemies. As you start becoming overpowered at about the same time the game loses the ability to retain its illusion of having a world filled with things to explore, you will start experiencing these issues firsthand. There are tons of weapons in this game and each weapon type has different attacks. You can now learn to use shields or to wield two one-handed weapons at once. You can also relearn how to use two-handed weapons. If you haven't learned that skill from a teacher, you can't use that type of weapon. That sounds amazing! But there is a catch. Despite there being multiple skill levels for each weapon type, the animations don't ever change. Every weapon has a light attack, a normal attack, a charged attack, a swing from above or a stab and in case of a two-handed weapon, a whirlwind attack. The only attack limited by a stamina bar. Your stamina is only used for this and sprinting. We can't address the next issue with the entire weapon and spell roster without diving into combat, so we need to get to the other stuff first. The crafting system was significantly enhanced and is great for what it wants to be. Incredibly appreciated comfort changes have been made to the entire RPG gameplay. You can skill yourself in more ways than ever before as you have to level up things like health too. Range combat works good in general and you actually have to aim with your bow or crossbow, which also have different types of ammunition. Here is where the good things already end though. I will say this however, this game can still offer you many fun hours of gameplay despite what comes now. Despite being buggy and broken. There is one more mechanic that makes 95% of all weapons useless. Range. Range is everything. Because the combat is all about who can hit and spam attacks first. Which means that the only really viable weapon for two-handers is the halberd and one-handed weapons are limited to only about four or eight weapons that are of good use. With two dominating everything. I also preferred fighting without shields because of the stab attack which can serve as a way to spam an enemy to death. Also, there is no critical hit system anymore, just like the previous games. Weapon damage scales with abilities, melee damage scales with your strength, range damage scales with dexterity, and magic scales with ancient knowledge. Yes, magic scales in this game. As it does so, the variety of spells has been significantly reduced. If we sort them into useless and overpowered, then it would look pretty much like this. And now all we need is to scratch all these useless abilities and items. Huh, it doesn't really appear to be that complex anymore. The guild system, which was fine tuned in Gothic 2, has been scrapped and replaced by an inconsequential reputation system that serves as a limiter for which armor you can buy, but why? A major part of this game are revolutions. Basically, kill everyone at that location. The problem is, the game forgets to mention that some events in the second main quest force you to do revolutions and if you did any previously, then there might be a chance that you'll ruin your entire playthrough by accident and major items that you need to get to the ending disappear when enemies flee from the location. It never respawns, it never returns, you're screwed, the end. At least I can enjoy stealing things. You are only allowed to steal quest related items. No. If you steal an item, a counter for that location remembers the value of that item and once you reach a certain amount, which happens very early, the guards warn you. Halt! Hier sind einige wertvolle Sachen verschwunden. Nein. And if you steal more, the entire city will attack you, making it impossible to do anything there anymore. Great. As you can see, the graphics look dated, but Mirtana and Nordmar are still very enjoyable areas. Let's summarize this. The combat was reworked and added a few things, but overall was watered down for a more casual audience. No joke. Taking on three big guys at the same time and not dying early game kind of kills the mood. Don't get me wrong, adding a few new features doesn't mean we have to take a casual walk through the not Elder Scrolls. Oblivion. I like the music, giving me a menu where the audio isn't automatically blasting out my eardrums is a huge bonus. Even modern games have a problem with this, and I hate it. 
This game doesn't do that. It gave me audio levels that were properly balanced. The trading system screws you over if you're not paying attention, and it's how I cost myself a good 5 hours and a good 10k gold. I hate how tailored it is for casuals. Ultimately, the story left me expecting a better third game. I regret telling my friends to try this franchise, and I haven't seen this much of a letdown since Dead Space 3. This installment is too schizophrenic for me to give anything more than a 3 and setting it at playable. Screw Oshidim, screw Morasul, and f*** this game. The first 20 hours were enjoyable, the rest was a boring chore. <laughs>